Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, that was two sites. I've got four. <laughs> I don't stand much chance. Well, you don't stand much chance. <laughs> Almost a belief when it's the right one that comes up and it's not somebody's holiday clothes. <laughs> <laughs> or worse. <laughs> you had to go there. <laughs> okay, um, thank, thank you very much. Bear with me. I'll be ten minutes, but this is going to be an absolute rattle through. So effectively, it's four seasons of what the Wagon Way project has been up to. So I'm not going to our history, which is relatively recent. We're all volunteers, but we do have some professional people helping. That's professional archaeologists, not professional people. Um, in line with these sorts of things, 18th century wagon ways are all downhill from here, um, and they are literally all downhill. Um, what do we think? What button is it? Find the button. That one. That one? No. No. Uh, come on. You get the slideshow back? So, what I've got first of all are a few slides that just show, is the big one at the top? I think so. Obviously. It's, it's the right-hand arrow one for to take it forward. Oh, it's the other one. Yep. The opposite one is what we do. Right, so the last time we presented here, I think it was 2018, and we had um, some excavations at Kakenzie Harbour, which revealed the remains of the uh, 19th century, we think about 1815, but we know 1815 Iron Wagon Wave. We had some great results there. We were very impressed by it all. Um, we found sleeper blocks. We found... Uh, remains of turntables and the like. We did some great recording on the harbour front. There's some more work going on at the moment at Kakenji Harbour. Quite an important site. This is the remains of one of the uh, coal suits <coughs> and a turntable. There's the wagonway coming through in its later 1815s fish belly railed incarnation. But since then, we had, this, we had this revelation and went to Wellington. Well, I didn't get to go, but others went to Wellington and saw Wellington Wagonway which came down in Newcastle um, from the hills, just as Jeanette did. It's, it's later, but it survived, or some sections of it survived. We thought, well, maybe something survives of the wooden wagon way, the 1722 wagon way in uh, Trinette to Kakenzie as well. And as it turns out, it does. Um, we were really surprised by this because we thought, as has been talked about earlier on, that the state of preservation, um, particularly of the timber elements here, was going to be absolutely woeful. So this is 2021. And this is the excavation that we opened up in 2021. Um, this is the one that was on Digging for Britain, apparently, but uh, I wasn't invited to that, so that was <laughs> um, So it's, um, it's quite an interesting um, site, obviously, in that it's entirely linear, and the state of preservation varies massively as you go along that line. We just happened to hit upon, on a trial excavation three years ago, um, what appeared to be the remains of the wagon. We took a punt and thought we'd open up a bigger trench. So that's what we did. Um, we had volunteer excavators, we had professional excavators, and we found ah, <laughs> remains of the 19th century iron wagon way, including, interestingly, if you're a buff on these kind of things, some steel sections of iron rail, some sort of manufactured sections of what should be cast iron rails. Anyway, we also found timber, um, which was a real surprise but a delight. And as it turns out, we actually found a lot more. So if people have seen pictures of Wellington, state of preservation was fantastic there. They got the timbers, they put them, uh, put them aside, and they've managed to trace where they all came from. They were mostly from ships. Um, we didn't find that extent of preservation, but we did sign, find some pretty good remains. And you can see there, there's a central line of the wagon way coming across um, with some of the timbers in, in situ. Very, very poor preservation. It was largely just the outside of the timbers that survived. Um, so there's the excavation, um, more of the excavation. You can see this was a bit of a mishmash of timbers going that way, timbers going that way. We couldn't decipher it, but it took a bit of working out. Um, after getting back in, we managed to come up with three phases for the wagon way. The first one, 1722. Um, we know that this was a very simple plate, plate way where you had wooden trackway. So the, the horses were going on timber. This obviously didn't last very long. Moved to phase two, two more substantial um, cobbles in the centre, and interestingly, a wider gauge. It was obviously so successful, they widened the gauge, made the wagons bigger, and phase three made it bigger again, made it higher. There we go, there's an illustration, um, one of Alan's illustrations of the wagons going up and down. You see the build-up. This is happening over a relatively short period. 
But from the excavations, we know that the amount of coal that was dropping off the wagons was fairly substantial. So if you take all these wagons trundling up and down 360 days a, a year, dropping all the coal, that's going to build up pretty quickly. So these ditches were absolutely rammed full of coalways. And it's a good indication when you've got a coal track or a wagonway that you're going to get substantial evidence for compacted coal waste. There we go. This is what we know for the dates. 1722, 25, Thomas Matthew, John Horsey. 1728, William Adam. This was like a hunt to William Adam because there are two William Adams involved at Catenzi. Anyway, this is the William Adam that most people know about. Um, and 1743-44, William Grant and a Mr. Burroughs, or Burroughs. How can we be so accurate about those three dates for the building of the, the wagon weight? Well, as it turns out, we came across this in the National Records of Scotland. Now, it had already been written about, people had used it as source material, Chris Watley had, um, as had Jill Turnbull in her Glassworks book. Um, we, we dug it out. I mean, a bit of confusion first as to who might have written this diary that was in the, the, the National Records of Scotland. It turns out it was William Dixon. He wrote his name prolifically all over it, practicing. <laughs> <laughs> And there we have, there we have descriptions. This is particularly pertinent to some of the things we've been listening to today. October, last day, 1743. Um, I think that says, what does it say? Um, sawing, sawing oak timbers for the rails. Um, for Mr. Mr. Grant and Mr. Um, I don't know which one that is, um, So there we go. There are copious references throughout this to this right, working in Kikenzi, working on the wagonway. The three stages that we found on the, the excavations correspond with the three main periods of um, interest from William Dixon. We managed to get the book published um, of the, uh, the transcript and a lot of other commentary material um, on William Dixon's journals. It's here and it's available on our stand downstairs at £25. Um, we've got to thank, obviously, uh, Scottish uh, Record Society for publication here. Um, the journal is a fantastic record. It's Hellish dull reading if you're looking for a good story, but it's <laughs> fascinating in terms of what a tradesman was doing in the early 18th century and the types of things he was working on. We also found years and years ago this piece of a bottle, black stamp from a bottle, lying in somebody's basement. Archibald Robertson, 1730. Archibald Robertson was William Adam, the William Adams, uh, son-in-law. And we, uh, we know that there was this building called the Pavilion or the Ink Bottle or Cope's House or uh, Teddy Bell's House now. Um, but it's not actually there. Teddy Bell's bungalow is next door to it. Um, so we knew there was a glassworks. We've, we had a bit of a diverse interest in what was going on. Um, we were fairly certain this was a glassworks, but we weren't certain because there'd been very little evidence of it found, tangible evidence. And there were, I don't seem to be records of the building before it was demolished in the 1920s. There's Nelsie. You see Nelsie has a very similar little building, building there, pavilion. Um, it may have been in a kneeling house, it may have been the main glassworks. We've still to conclude that one. So, in 2020, during all of the lockdown nonsense, um, we had a harp, a, a, an excavation in people's back gardens. And we focused on back gardens that were around the, uh, around the area of the, the glassworks, which we know is to the east end of Port Seaton. So that was a really exciting excavation. It worked really well. Lots of running around, like being on the telly, and we found the most staggering stuff. So, well, if you're interested in glassworks, it was staggering. We found an awful lot of evidence for crucibles. These are the massive pots that the glass was manufactured in. And we found lots of snots and bits and pieces of glass waste, which I wouldn't bore you with. They might be fascinating, but they're not very good telly. So, um, there's, there's one incident. I don't know, is this treasure trove or not? This came out of somebody's skip, um, just opposite <laughs> where the glassworks was. That was a big, big, that's what a crucible, a glass crucible looks like. That's the thickness of it, about that high and about that diameter. It's like a massive flower pot. Anyway, my main interest in this was all to do with salt. Well, here we go, I'm running out of time already. So, I knew there was a salt pan somewhere along the coast that was uh, extant because I'd walked past it dozens and dozens of times. It's on the foreshore, we call it the Old Kirk. Last time we'd been here, we started out a little trial excavation in the corner of it. Last year, we did a much bigger excavation and we found really, really good evidence for the way these salt terms worked. Um, there's been several excavations of salt terms in Scotland. Um, I'm not going into all the detail of them. Suffice to say, um, what we've got here, I think, adds to the information of particularly the process and the development of these types of buildings. So it's a little bit of the old um, uh, sketch fab thing going on here. So you get to see this is our excavation from 2021. The black holes in the middle, square black holes, are later um, 
furnaces with ash pits below. So the furnace is on the level of that cast iron beam that you can see just going vertically here. Um, and these are the pits. So we only got the front section facing the sea of the, of the works. But this is inserted into a much earlier structure, which we know was constructed in the uh, mid-1600s. Quick comparison, these are other bow-ended, curved-fronted um, salterns in Scotland. There's our one at the end. Rattling through this. So, made a little model of it. Interesting thing about these is, they didn't work as a lot of people think they worked. When they were first built, you had a big fire in the middle of this structure, and the flue, a bit like a pizza oven, went up over the, the furnace entrance door. So you fed the coal in, it burned, and the flue came back up a chimney that was in the middle. They were later adapted because there were so many concerns about the efficiency of using your coal for burnt making salt, which is horrifically inefficient, as we know from our experiments we talked about last time we were here. So there's a little um, model of it. These little bits at the side, the little corner structures were to hold the pan. And there were walls internally that stopped the fire from getting to the external walls. And we now know as well that there were some quite large openings on the outside. So you can see that there's a, an arched opening there right into the side that would enable you to get almost a horse and cart into the side of the structure to take the ash out. There's a pan, it sat on top of it all. Um, and there was also further smaller ash doors on the other sides of the building. So there's not many of these surviving in Scotland. Very, very few. There's one in Preston Pans, if anybody cares to walk along the foreshore. It's not a bow fronted one, but it's been converted into a cottage and it survives because of that. Ah. Right. This is the gubbins that went into these structures later on. So this is what people refer to as a brander pan. Um, it's a relatively straightforward conversion of a big bonfire sitting on the floor to a proper grate system with an ash pit underneath. As I was drawing this, somebody posted on eBay this fabulous photograph. <laughs> <laughs> so there we, there we are. Um, this is at uh, Nantwich. That's the guts of one of the salterns in Scotland, really, um, without the building surrounding it. There you go, that's what we're talking about there. There we are. The building was two stories high, so you were in the top story of the building when you were operating it. Is it going to spin round? Yeah, it's going to spin round. And tacked on at the front end, where you approached it, not the seaward end, where all the governs of the chimney, the original chimney location, um, was a forehouse, which basically kept the workers dry. A lot of the examples of these seem to have a forehouse that's tacked on. It's an addition to the structure. So it may be that originally when these were worked, the workers were externally. There's a, the there's a forehouse there with the stair internally going up to the, the pan itself. And that's pretty much it, I think. Of course, at some point this was all roofed, and I'm not quite certain how it was roofed, but it's likely there were nice, nice timbers going across. There we are, Corley. That's the kind of thing I think it might have, might have been, as none of this survives. Um, and there we are. So that's the, that's the reproduction of the, the salt pan house, which we want to build one of these. Oh, no, I didn't say that. No, we, we're, we're thinking possibly <laughs> that we might try and build one of these, actually reconstruct it, because we still don't have a full handle on how they operated. Brownrigg described this in great detail, but there are still lots of questions about them. Um, this is 2022, Kickensie Old Kirk. We've started landscaping, and we've been landscaping, you would protected the archaeology and we're landscaping above to reflect the, the, uh, the archaeology below. Um, we've used some of the old bricks from the 19th century um, uh, building that was above. This is, so these are called flattens, and I always thought it's flattens because it's flatten. But according to local mason, it's flattened because they're flattens, you know, the flat ones, they're not... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this year, I'll be very quick with this, I promise, um, there's Ant staring down a hole, and we excavated the coal falls, which is the main store for the coal that was being exported. Most of this coal seems to have gone to the salt pans. A lot of it though, was exported by ship. So down next to Kenzie Harbour, there was an area which was set aside for coal. The wagon became in at the higher level, and they dropped the coal down. Quite a substantial drop. We didn't get to the bottom of this, um, where it was collected and then taken away by ship. William Dixon refers copiously to um, working on ships at the altering holds and things like that, and the mechanisms for the coal by the book. Really good. Um, and I think that's us. So we've been kept going. More of the museum. There's always museums open some weekends, most weekends probably. Come and see Mr. Cattle's office, which was one of our other lockdown projects. Thank you very much. <laughs>